I want to spend a little bit of time, um, you know, talking about a number of other issues that really start a long ways away from Ardmore, Oklahoma, uh, in terms of things that I think are changing or have changed in the cattle industry or have changed in other parts of agriculture that affect the cattle industry and, and really should be in your mind. Now, I'm not going to talk about the drought as much as most of the other speakers have. It's certainly a big part of what's, what we're facing with. Some of the things I'm going to talk about are things that you need to have in mind when we get to that point where we're, you know, rebuilding and recovering from the drought and so on. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of issues out here in terms of where we are with cattle numbers. We've got high cattle prices. I'm not going to do outlook per se, but certainly going to refer to the environment we're in. I'm not going to talk about beef demand, but it's an issue that's out there. We've got high grain prices. We've got low forage supplies and high forage prices around the country. We have the lowest hay supplies in this country right now that we've had since 1957. Two years of drought have really drawn down forage supplies around the country. And, and that's a big issue. We're, we're very well aware of it locally, but maybe not so much nationally. Beyond grain and forage, other input prices are high. Uh, and then we've got some other issues that are, uh, you know, again, well beyond where we are here at the, the cow-calf and, and stalker level a little bit in terms of some of the structural issues facing the industry. So there's a lot of things out there. I'm not going to talk about some of them at all, but and some others only briefly. And then I'm going to bring it back down to the cow-calf level and again, try to challenge you going forward to think about uh, some things that I think you need to have on your mind. In a very broad sense, agriculture, not only in the U.S., but all over the world, is being asked to do more things. Most importantly, over the next 20 or 30 years, we're being asked to feed 9 billion people. And we can do it, when we will do it. But it means things change. And what it really means, more importantly than anything, is there's more competition for resources, and the biggest limiting resource in agriculture is land. Always has been, and it still is. And so things that are happening in terms of crop agriculture in other parts of the country and around the world have an impact on the way the cattle industry is going to work as well. And again, we've got lots of issues with input prices. So cattle numbers are low. I put this chart in just because I haven't done a presentation in 20 years that didn't have this chart in it, I don't think. Um, but you know where we are. We do have very low numbers. We are lower than we need to be. We're smaller as an industry than we need to be. Uh, we didn't plan to be here. The last two years of drought has only been the latest in a series of things that have pushed us in terms of cattle liquidation to be at this level. Um, but the bottom line is we're smaller than we need to be. We do need to regrow, and we will when we get the chance. But uh, that involves a lot of issues then on exactly how that's going to happen and how fast it's going to happen. The beef cow herd, given where we are now, which is right here, uh, you know, under the best of circumstances, these are just my guesses, uh, and they do change as I get different information. But, you know, I think uh, a reasonable scenario, if the drought moderates now or this spring, and we have a more or less normal year to start this year and go from here, I think by, you know, something like 2017, we might have cow numbers in this country back to where they were just two years ago at the beginning of 2011. I think it probably takes that long to recoup what we've lost the last two years of drought. We probably need to be bigger than that because we had several years of liquidation prior to that that was due to factors that, that were external that caused us to liquidate so we're probably talking about, under the best of circumstances, drought aside, close to a decade minimal to really rebuild this cattle industry, okay? One of the other big changes, of course, that's happened in, this, in, this, in the agriculture in the U.S. is a tremendous change in the corn market. And it may not seem like it affects you very much, but it does. Corn prices, for many, many years, were down in this range, and of course now we're up here uh, this year still finishing out our drought impacts at a very high level, but even with a normal year in terms of corn production, we're looking at probably corn prices that are staying in this $5 range plus or minus, okay? And that's a lot bigger than it was historically and it has implications as we think about what will be the average corn price in the next 20 years compared to what it was for the 20 years prior to about 2007. So that leads to this question or statement. 
The beef industry can survive high corn prices better than our competing meats industries, pork and poultry. Do you believe that's a true statement? I'm hearing some yeses. Why is that true? Cattle can eat things pigs and chickens don't do very well on. Okay, we have more flexibility. God made cattle ruminants. That's both an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage in that we can eat things they can't eat. Okay, it's got some disadvantages too that we have to deal with and we've been talking about some of those. <laughs> that's the true part of that statement and that's the advantage part of that statement. I do think long term the beef industry actually has a relative advantage compared to pork and poultry when corn prices are high. We can do things differently. The problem is it don't work unless you do things differently. You can't keep doing what you've always done to realize that advantage. We have evolved to do what we do in the beef industry over a long time, you know, since certainly since the 1960s. If you think about everything we do, particularly at the feedlot level, most of that has been driven by cheap corn, which was really a product of cheap energy and all that other stuff that goes with it. Okay? Our industry evolved over a long period of time under a certain set of incentives at that level, but that had a lot of implications for what we do out here in the country. Okay? We became, over time, very grain intensive. For 50 years, the primary incentive in this industry was to get cattle to eat more grain and feed more like chickens and pigs. And we've done remarkably well at that, by the way. We're very good. Okay? We respond to incentives very well. And we can do things with cattle now in terms of feeding and, and productivity at that level that we never dreamed we could do 30 years ago or 40 years ago. What it's done along the way has really limited the forage side of this industry. And that grain incentive has driven a lot of things that I think is, it, it, it goes all the way down to the kinds of cattle that we have demanded in this industry, that have been demanded in this industry. The size of cattle. Uh, Hugh, I think it was earlier, talking about sort of weight creep on cow sizes and how that's probably, and Ron mentioned the fact that we have a lot of cows that maybe aren't the best adapted to their environments. I think a lot of that was driven by the fact that on the one hand, we were trying to respond to the incentives feedlots wanted, which was big cattle that could eat a lot of corn. And that's why we did that. And if that changes, it has implications for us. Most of the time, this chart goes back to the early 80s, this expresses the cost of hay and corn on a TDN basis, on an energy basis as animal feed. For most of that time period, corn was cheaper than hay on an energy basis. Forage was more expensive than corn. And so we naturally responded to incentives to utilize a lot of corn. There were only two times on this chart where corn jumped up above uh, hay on a TDN basis. Notice what happened to this price relationship in about 2008. Actually, it was 2010, I think, on here. Now, all of a sudden, corn is not the cheapest source of energy. Okay, because of all those other demands, all those things going on in markets a long ways from here, we've changed the fundamental relationship in value between grains and forages. That has big impacts. Okay, so here's cattle prices. This particular average was from the early 90s through 2006 for steers at Oklahoma City. If you take those numbers and calculate the value of stocker gain or the value of adding weight to feeder cattle for a bunch of combinations of things. Now, don't worry about all these numbers. It's not important that you understand all that matters here is look at all of these numbers, which is the value of gain in, in dollars per pound, okay, or, or think of it as cents per pound, 56 cents a pound or whatever. Look at all these numbers. What you notice is that for all of these years, on average, for any kind of stocker program that you did, the average value of gain was about 57 cents a pound. Okay, now there's a couple messages in there. One is that it doesn't matter what kind of program you do. If you do it long enough, on average, you get what everybody else gets. Okay, so there's no secret to making more money than everybody else in the stocker business. That's what that tells you. Okay, that's one message. <laughs> but the other one, the other question that I would have for you 
is why was the value of gain limited to 57 cents a pound? What made the value of putting weight on cattle out in the country 57 cents a pound? That's exactly right. If you didn't hear what he said, he said that's what it cost to put it on in the feedlot. The average cost of gain in the feedlot for all those years, 1992 through 2006, was about 55 or 56 cents a pound. That's what limited the value of forage. That's where it comes back home here. Cheap corn for 50 years in this country made your forage worth less because the industry went to the cheapest and, and the industry evolved to utilize the cheapest feed source. Of course, what's happened since then? The most recent month, the cost of gain was $1.25 a pound. What does that do to the value of forage? You know, how do feedlots make decisions? Feedlot managers get up every morning and they say, you know, I got to have cattle this week. And they ask themselves, would I rather buy pounds or put them on myself? For all of these years, they could put on weight cheaper than anybody in the country, and they'd rather put on those pounds themselves. So what did they do? They bought lightweight calves, younger and younger calves. They spent a hell of a long time in the feedlot eating a lot of corn, and they put it on cheap. Now they can't do that. So what would they rather do? They'd rather buy those pounds from somebody else who can put it on at least as cheap as that. That makes your forage worth more. Now you're saying, okay, I'm not in the stocker business. That's the value of forage. That's what's going to set the value of forage, and it's going to translate through to the cow-calf side as well. Okay, this has two implications for you. Okay, one is it sets the value of forage, and that's going to, that's going to reflect directly on your cow-calf thing. It also ought to suggest to you that retained ownership, at least through the stocker phase, may make more sense. The value of putting more weight on your own calves is worth more now on average than it was then. Let's look at what's happened the last three years. I took a three-year average to take out some of the weekly variation. This is prices the, by, by weight. And if you calculate values again, again, there's a tremendous bunch of numbers on here. Don't worry about them all. I just said, what if we started with different size animals at the beginning using the actual prices and the weights and calculate the value of gain. And I highlighted these boxes because they all represent 250 pounds of gain. And what you see it pretty consistently is the value of gain has averaged 80 to 90 cents in response to those higher grain prices. So what has happened in markets a long ways from here has a lot of implications for the value of forage. I think high grain prices changes things in this industry. I think it gives us an incentive to go back to being more forage focused. It makes your forage worth more because that's the way we're going to respond long term to that advantage we have in the cattle industry. So we're going to adapt beef production systems to higher proportion of forage use, primarily, at least in the short run, by increasing placement weights. The market is going to reward you for putting more weight on cattle out in the country before they go to the feedlot. Okay. Think about the implications of this difference, though. We talk about, and, and people always talk about feedlot conversion as a measure. It's, a, it's the most common measure of efficiency at the feedlot level, feed conversion. If you average this out through the year, it takes about six pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef. And that's sometimes the charges leveled against the beef industry. You know, we're not very efficient compared to pork and poultry. The problem is we're not actually measuring beef production efficiency there. We're just measuring the feedlot part of beef production. Okay, If you take the whole size of that animal, that 13 or 1,400 pound slaughter animal, and you look at the total amount of weight that animal has at slaughter by the amount of grain it used, it's actually not that bad because we put on a lot of weight already at the forage level. But look at this, and this is, these are rough numbers. If you're placing a very lightweight animal, that efficiency overall is, is higher, or it's less, it's actually lower efficiency. It takes more pounds of grain to produce a pound of beef. One of the things you can do in response to high price grain is increase the weight at which you start with them in the feedlot. You can increase the efficiency, pull that conversion down in terms of the pounds of grain it takes over the entire size of the animal to produce weight. That's the incentive this industry faces now, 
to some degree. Okay? Now let me talk about the cow-calf part for a few minutes here and challenge you to think about things. I've said this for years, and I think most of you know this and you accept it. You're not really in the cattle business. You're all in the forage business. That's what you really produce. And if you've been doing that all along and you've been thinking about it that way all along, you're already doing a lot of things right. Because when you think about what we think of as the cattle business, be it cow-calf or stalker, if you think about it from the standpoint of marketing forage and ask yourself, what's the best way to market my forage, you're already making a lot of decisions right. And you have been for a long time. This is going to enhance that even more because that forage is worth more now than it has been for a long time. Okay, so let's talk about technical efficiency versus economic efficiency. You know, we use a lot of technical measures on individual things, calving percentage, weaning percentage, weaning weight, stocking rate, all of those things. They're all important, okay? Economic efficiency is the value of what we produce divided by the cost, okay? The right answer isn't always to maximize everything, it's to optimize stuff relative to what it costs you to do it. Okay, and that's what economic efficiency really focuses on is it says, let's look at these technical measures, but eventually we have to evaluate them in terms of value of output relative to, you know, per dollar of cost. And we might look at it then in terms of something like net return per cow. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm going to suggest to you that maybe a better one to focus on for the next, well, from now on, maybe always has been, is net return per acre. That gets it back to the land. That gets it back to that forage base that you're really in the business of. Okay. Technical efficiency in general is closer to economic efficiency when inputs are cheap. When corn was cheap for 50 years, pretty much anything this industry could do to get cattle to eat more corn was technically efficient in terms of corn use. It was also pretty economically efficient because it was the cheapest source of energy. When it's not the cheapest source of energy, it becomes a less useful measure, okay? That's true for things like, you know, uh, fertilizer in pastures or fertilizer on crops, okay? When the inputs are cheap, when fuel and chemicals and, and fertilizer is cheap, maximizing yields makes a lot of sense. But when those inputs start to get more expensive, you have to find that cutoff where optimum is, and it's somewhere less than where maximum is in most cases. I'm going to suggest that maximizing value of production per acre is going to be an objective we want to talk about a little bit, okay? And I'm going to go through several things here. Reduce stocking rates. I've heard that two or three times this afternoon. The idea that even at average stocking, and certainly if you're in an overstock situation, that's particularly dangerous, not only in a drought environment, but in a long run sense. That's going to increase your need on a regular basis for additional feed resources. Maybe that wasn't as much of an issue in the past when those feeds were not as expensive, but they are now. And so the cost of operating that way, particularly if you're overstocked, if you've had that weight creep on your cows and you're really overstocked to begin with, you're already vulnerable to not having enough feed even without a drought. And what happens when you get into a drought? You face tremendously increased feed needs and the prospect of a very debilitating liquidation. Not only that, long term, you're not doing any good to your pastures and you're reducing your overall productivity anyway. You're in the grass business. You have to manage that resource first and foremost, in my opinion. This has been mentioned as a part of that Moderating cow size, matching the cow to the environment, that will reduce your feed needs on an ongoing basis, let alone when you get into a short supply situation. Okay, and again, I think these cows in many cases are much bigger than we realize they are. And they eat a lot more, and they're much more vulnerable to that volatility in forage production that, that comes in an environment like we work in here. Reducing annual cow cost is a big one that hasn't been talked about as much. That covers everything at some level, and I'm going to go through just a few things and suggest some things to think about. Can you reduce grazing cost? Feed costs are the biggest uh, component of cow costs, and it consists really of three parts in most cases. Grazing, 
supplemental harvested forages and supplemental concentrate feeds or protein feeds that you might need. Okay, so the question is, can you reduce any or all of these? Forage is worth more now, and it's worth managing better. Okay, it's worth managing it in terms of improving, improving the amount of forage you have available, uh, extending your grazing season so you don't need as much hay and other supplemental feed, particularly if you can change the quality. And here's one of my pet peeves, hay production, storage, and feeding. Round bale technology, God bless it, was one of the greatest hay wasters ever invented. It has made it really easy for us to A, put up a lot of stuff that probably wasn't worth baling in the first place, not storing it properly so we lose 20 to 40 percent of it before we ever try to feed it and losing another 20 to 40 percent when we do feed it. We didn't do a better job of that because for a lot of years those bales weren't worth a whole bunch. But they are now and you can't afford to keep doing that. And if you do those two things right, you probably have a pretty good chance of reducing supplement needs. Manage your forage for more production. We have millions of acres of Oklahoma from here north to the Kansas line that are heavily infested with red cedar. That's just one example. If you're giving up more forage because you're losing it to things like red cedar, it's worth more now to control that because you're giving up more value. Maybe we need to think about some different forages. In a world of cheap inputs, Bermuda grass is a fantastic grass. The problem is you gotta have a very close relationship with your fertilizer dealer to make it work. It's a racehorse among grasses, but it takes a tremendous amount of inputs to make it work. And it made a lot of sense at one point in time. Long term, it may make less sense if we're gonna be in a world of high fertilizer prices. There may be grasses that are less technically efficient, but they use so much less inputs that they're more economically efficient. In a world of high fertilizer prices, there may be a bigger role in general for legumes and pasture mixes. Maybe there's some other kinds of forage things that we need to be looking at to extend our grazing season or provide a different quality of forage at a certain time of the year. Okay, and there's beginning to be more interest in things like winter peas, uh, turnips, and radishes and some of that other stuff, okay? And there's a reason why some folks are starting to talk about that a bit more, because it, be, it, may, it may be worth taking a look at. Particularly for smaller producers, probably the biggest economic factor that makes them high cost operation is they all suffer from iron toxicity. They got too much stuff sitting around that spends nine months of the year or eight months of the year rusting and not getting used very efficiently. Okay, I have a, a colleague in the southeast part of the country. He likes to refer to the amount of recreational haying we do in this country. I think for a long time we have done a fair amount of recreational haying, and you can still do that. I'm not going to tell you you should change your lifestyle, but what I'm telling you is the economics has changed, and your lifestyle may cost you more now than it once did. Okay, so you need to reevaluate these things. Can you get by with less? It's something you have to figure out. Maybe you don't need it. If you're successful at reducing your need for hay on the one hand, maybe you're also then successful at reducing your need for haying equipment. Might be cheaper to just go buy what you need from somebody else. Last couple things, retained ownership. I mentioned this earlier. We may need to be thinking about not how many cows we can run or used to run, but really focus on this notion of value per acre of production. And that may deliberately mean less cows, but more other things like seasonal stocker production or retained ownership. The role of that is higher now than it has been for many, many years. And so think about marketing your forage to its best use. We have historically not done a particularly good job of marketing the cull cows. For most cow-calf operations, call animals represents 15 to 20 percent of your total revenues. But what do we typically do? If it's a spring calving operation, we run them in in the fall, we wean the calves, we send the cows to town when they're in their worst shape of the year at the time of the year when the price is the lowest. This is percent change in cull-cow price, the red bar is, 
for a long-term average, 10 years, from November, which is typically the low, to January, about an 8% increase in price, 16% or so to, till February, up to about 18% by March, close to 20 by April, and over 20, 22, 21 or 22 by May. That's the same cow, okay? If you kept her and she didn't gain a pound, she's worth 18% more in March than she was in November on average. And surely to God you wouldn't just keep her at the same weight because you brought her in and brought her in when she was thin and everything else. You know, cows can utilize some, some of your poor quality feed resources. Those cull cows can put on a little bit of weight in 60 or 90 days. They'll sell for more money because their price went up. They'll sell for more money because they weigh more. And if you put one body condition score on them, they'll sell more because they dress better as a killer cow. We haven't tried too hard to do that, and there's ways to do that, and fit it into everything else you're doing in terms of utilizing your feed resources most efficiently. We have the lowest beef cow herd since 1962, right now. We have the lowest all cattle inventory in this country since 1952. And this year's calf crop will probably be the smallest calf crop in this country since 1942. Now, I actually had to estimate that last number because my data doesn't even go that far back, okay? We've got essentially record high prices. We're going to generally have strong supply-driven prices for several years in this industry. What does that mean for profitability? I think it all depends on how you manage the cost side. In a light of, of an increased forage focus, you know, in light of marketing forage to its best use, then I think you've got some opportunities for profits in this environment. It will be challenging, and I think things have changed a little bit. I think the answers today to the old questions might be different than they've been in the past. And so I think you need to go back and really evaluate things at a fairly basic level and start from the ground up to figure out what the right answer is for you on a whole bunch of these issues. Cost management is the key. It always has been, but even more so in this environment. That's the challenge before you, I think.